sorry about that. Um, I'm sitting next to a fellow Jayhawk fan, and so we were, we were talking about last night. Okay. Good morning. My name is Mike Darnell, and I am a member of the Board of Trustees of this co congregation. Welcome to all, all of you. The Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Elkhart is a welcoming community encouraging religious freedom, nurturing individual, spiritual, and ethical growth, celebrating uh, diversity, and promoting a just and sustainable world. If you would like to learn more about this fellowship, please look at our website at uufe.org. It's really nice. And join us after the service for our coffee hour. For, our, for the listening enjoyment of all, we ask you at this time to please turn off all cell phones. Also, if you need hearing support, please ask for help at the, at the sound desk. Thank you. Good morning, and I'm Judy Darnell, and I have our Fellowship Life this morning which is longer than I thought it was going to be because I got a couple of surprise announcements as I was coming in. So, uh, First of all, uh, the volunteer at, um, clipboard is, should be passed around about this time. I guess it's going. And preparations are being made for more improvements in the Learning Center. Linda Becker organized a work party yesterday to move materials and furniture out of the way for installation of the new flooring there. So thank you, Linda, for your hours of labor and your helpers, T.J. Shaw, Mark Dar Mike Darnell, Joan Claiborne, Ken Claiborne, Phyllis Hostetler, and Gordon Hostetler. So they were big helps for us. April 1st at 10 o'clock, there will be a Zoom Building and Grounds meeting. So um, if you're on Building and Grounds or are even interested, uh, be sure to log in. If you aren't on the email list for that, be sure to let Mike know. The Society of Radical Readers will meet Tuesday at 7 p.m., but that's Tuesday and not Friday as it has been, on April 4th to discuss the changes and the impacts that the Humanist Manifestos have had on UU and American culture. The Manifestos are available at the American Humanist Association website, and if you don't have access to a printer, there are two copies on the Ivy Island, or you can let me know if uh, someone beat you to them and I'll see if I can print off a, a copy. And Mike and I will be uh, turning the fellowship focus over to a new editor or two after we issue the June focus at the end of May. If you are even curious about having how we put uh, those together, we will be glad to answer your questions. So see one of us during coffee hour and potluck. Our attendance last Sunday was 45 adults and children in person, and we had 20 over YouTube. Uh, so. At, with a collection of $173 that was shared with our friends at the NAACP. And lastly, Linda Becker would like to share some information with you. So uh, I'm going to take the kids now. So. I was just reminded that potluck is today also. Thanks, Mary. I'm Linda, good morning. Um, I'm gonna repeat some of the things that Judy said on behalf of Building and Grounds Committee and the Learning Center Task Force. I, I'd like to update you on the progress that we accomplished yesterday in the Learning Center. There was a small but mighty group and it was T.J. Shaw, Phyllis and Gordon Hostetler, uh, Judy and Mike Darnell, Kim Claiborne and myself. And we made significant progress um, in the Learning Center for the laying of the new floor, which will be in a few weeks. Um, bookshelves were emptied and moved. Two bedrooms in the family room were cleared out. Archive files reviewed and items were taken for donation to Goodwill, I believe it was Goodwill. Um, actually, we accomplished more than we thought we could. And the Learning Center is looking so much better. I'm so excited about it. I've been over there already, and the uh, door is unlocked, and I'd be glad to show everybody around following service. Um, most of us, though, although, uh, are on another committee, or two, probably. And what we have across over there is a modest three-bedroom home 
with a living room, a family room, uh, one and a half baths, and a bright sunny kitchen. But it's in need of love and attention. And so um, it is a house that belongs to all of us. So we're asking for your support and your help to finish some of the projects that are still outstanding. Um, I do have a sign up list here. Um, let's see here which has small projects, including pulling nails out of walls, as well as painting, cleaning cupboards, washing the inside of windows, yard maintenance, and other outside big projects like repairing the ramp and sealing it and painting the house foundation, it, it needs it. Um, and if we all do our part, we can get the work done in a timely manner and our house can shine again. So today I'll go ahead and pass around the sign-up sheet and then I'll, I'll end up leaving it on the Ivy Island. After service, um, I will be going over to the house. I've already got the door unlocked. I've already checked again this morning. It looks so much better. Um, there's more to do and with all of our help, we can get it done and we wanna do it as soon as we can. So thank you in advance for your support. You can put me down for painting. <laughs> I'm Laura Snow. And we ring the gong three times. Once for those who came before us. Once for those of us who are here now. And once for those who'll come after us and build on the dream. Today's chalice lighting is uh, something that um, Jenny Peake sent me and wrote up. So these are Jenny's thoughts and words. Our chalice flame this morning symbolizes the gap between rich and poor, the haves and the have-nots, us and them. May these distinctions blur as we consider ourselves wholly capable of landing here or there even in the same breath. Now, if you'll join me in our unison covenant, love is the spirit of this church and service is its law to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. This is our covenant. Good morning. I'm Carl Rust, and I wear several hats. And one of my hats is technology, so I'm going to do a little technology musing this morning. <clears throat> technology, we love to hate it. But it's hard to imagine what we would do without it. Thomas Edison said, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that it won't work. <laughs> so I'm going to take you back a few years. When I graduated from high school in 1975, there was not one single computer in my entire school. When I started teaching in 1989, there was one computer shared by three sixth grade teachers. Soon there was one in every classroom, then two, then three. Then we had a computer lab. Now every kid has a device. I'm not sure exactly when I got my first cell phone, but it was a clunky little device 
It didn't do a whole lot except make phone calls. Advances followed advances as computer chips got smaller and more powerful. And now I carry this little personal computer in my pocket, which is on Zoom right now, so I can check the sound, make sure things coming through. Yep. And it's a million times more powerful than the first computer I ever owned. By the way, I should have kept that dinosaur of a computer. It would probably be a collector's item now, maybe worth a few bucks. Fast forward to March 2000 or 2020. I had never heard of Zoom. Boy, did I find out about it quickly. When the pandemic shut everything down, Reverend Amy and Kevin DeBeck started recording a service and putting it on YouTube for Sunday morning. We did that Sunday morning recording service, recorded service for a long time and made the leap to Zoom. Now we're doing a hybrid service. Most of us in person, a few on Zoom, and others watching the recording later on YouTube. To be honest, this has been a burden, cheerfully shouldered by a few of us. Now we are thinking it might be time to streamline and simplify. So we are going to try to do some things differently. You will see some changes starting today. You may have already noticed a few changes. But we want to hear your feedback. And the people on Zoom, they've got a little poll that they're supposed to be filling out. Hopefully they're doing that. We want to make things better, but we also want to make things less complicated and easier for others to feel comfortable helping out. At the same time, we don't want to lose the value that technology has given us. We've made it easier for friends from far and wide and also near but maybe indisposed to be a part of our Sunday morning. By the way, if you're interested in learning about sound, video, Zoom, or other aspects of the tech experience here at UUFE, please let me know. We need more hands to make lighter work. Thank you.
stand if you are willing and able and turn to 318, the Finlandia tune. It is so good to be with you. I will start with a confession that I make a lot of, make, of mistakes, and I say hallelujah. When Carl mentioned the uh, 10,000 ways not to do something, that quote, I thought of Bob Ross, who called them happy accidents. Mistakes are a part of being human. They are part of vulnerability, and that is sort of what we're getting into today. I begin with a definition. It's just one anyone can find very easily. And I think it speaks to US American culture, especially of how we define vulnerability and perhaps it speaks volumes to why we wrestle against vulnerability. We would rather do anything but to experience it or more um, to the point uh, have it recognized by others that we have some vulnerabilities. So this definition is the quality or state of being exposed to the possibility of being attacked or harmed, either physically or emotionally. The quality or state of being exposed to the possibility of harm, physically or emotionally. So who is going to seek that state of being? Who says, sign me up? I don't. I think most of us would rather do anything than to expose ourselves to that kind of uh, risk of being. And yet we have a lot of protecting ourselves to do, especially as I see it in the United States. The adversarial history is evident everywhere. We come across it in competitive sports. We find it in schools, education. We find it in career choices, corporate careers. We find it in medicine and in research and in the government everywhere. Everywhere we go, we feel this risk that we have to protect ourselves, lead with our strengths, lead with our best foot forward, they say. Uh, we do this in our resumes. We do this in our speeches. We try to 
<sighs> we try to plan for every eventuality, every possible circumstance, so that we will not be caught unawares, off guard, holding the ball and not knowing what to do next. We avoid vulnerability. Of course we do. It's a logical, natural choice given that definition. One measure, this was offered me by a, by a counselor I knew years ago. She said, you know, one measure of the risk of vulnerability or rather the health, the mental health of any given workspace could be how many of its employees at all levels are managing their anxiety, their risk of emotional attack, their per their perception of that with anxiety, anti-anxiety medications, depression, therapy, anywhere they go, they're trying to look for that self-help so they can just get by the day to day. What a sorry yardstick that we need for measuring the health of the spaces we might find ourselves in. So I mentioned several there. I, I named uh, sports, education, and so on. Um, I didn't talk about religion. It shows up everywhere, this vulnerability, and it shows up here too. Where do we keep our insecurities? Do we hide them? And I, I ask each of us to spend a moment and wonder, where are my self-doubts living in my body? Where are yours living in your body? How are we keeping them hidden from one another? It shows up in our religious communities too, but maybe not the way you would think. The language here, the message in so many of our religious communities has been what we are charged to do, our mission statement, our how we're going to be together, our sacred texts we may turn to. We are told to feed the hungry. We are told to shelter the homeless. We strive to clothe the naked, protect the vulnerable. The vulnerable, those at risk of being attacked. But did you hear the language there that I just used? And these are words I've used all my life and only have begun to think of them more uh, uh, deeply. These are labels. These are labels. Labeling humans by their living conditions by their vulnerability. We aren't saying people, we're saying the homeless, naked, hungry, the vulnerable. So we have this common definition, the secular definition of vulnerable as being at risk. And we have in religious text then, the language of what vulnerability looks like. Well, it's the people that don't have anywhere to live. It's the people on the streets, displaced, hungry, naked. We could add today, uh, as we widen our awareness of the ways we can inflict vulnerability as a society on fellow humans, we can add the oppressed, the imprisoned, the enslaved, still using the somewhat dehumanizing language of naming people by their state of vulnerability. And then we get to charge ourselves and religious community with ending these states of being that are so risky. We can charge ourselves and religious community with at least easing the pain where we can. We're not alone. There's plenty of NGOs, nonprofits, religious communities, including yours, including mine, the Unitarian Universalists, so many other denominations to do what we can. We, how many of us do the at need real time work of trying to provide shelter, raising funds, dropping off donations of food and clothing, uh, doing what we can to assure potable water, drinking water for folks. We also work 
and other ways uh, to change or influence policies, right? We write our elected officials. We work on the language of these policies that could then uh, maybe more um, long term ease the suffering abolish enslavement, um, find ways to get people out of prisons. We're still missing the point a little bit. I will never say let's not do those things. Those, those do need done. They do. And yet, all of it is requiring us to so subtly in our very core of our beings, buy into and maintain that secular vulnerability, that very limited definition of the state of being at risk of attack. And once we do that, once we bring that definition into our bodies, we accept it, well then which side are we going to try and identify with the most? For all of this, it's going to require us to view vulnerability only as a state of being to be despised, to loathe it to loathe the vulnerability in these terms. Uh, we loathe hunger, we loathe, we loathe uh, risk of being uh, harmed, of being attacked. Well, okay, where is Jenny going with this? Because we do loathe those things. We would hope for no one to have that kind of suffering. But if we're going to break through this dichotomous relationship, this either or, black and white, this either or relationship with vulnerability, we've got to dig deeper and we need a broader definition, one that is life giving, one that allows us a little wiggle room to begin to do that introspection of what is vulnerability in here? Where is it feeling in the body and what would it be if we let one another see it or perceive it. Brene Brown is a researcher. Um, many of you I'm sure are familiar with Brene Brown's work. If not, she wrote a book called, the, uh, called Daring Greatly. Her definition of vulnerability is a little softer. It's the risk is still there, but it's defined as by Brown, uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. And those still can feel a little yuck, but they also allow for us to begin to explore how this is part of the human experience as well. This definition does keep the risk language, but it expands it. She is convinced, Brown is convinced, that risking vulnerability is actually a path to wellness, to a deepening of relationships. Now, for us in religious community, what I hope our concern is, and what I've, what I've come to define religion as, and religious spaces as, those spaces and that practice of exploring constantly together in community what it is to be human. And so sure, we're going to do some easing of the suffering. Like I said, let's, let's not stop doing those things. But under it is a charge that we can accept to explore what is that fully human condition that means we are at risk. We are vulnerable. We have uncertainty. We have tender emotions that we may choose to share or at least recognize in each other. Self-doubt, the inner critic, all of it. These are all part of the human experience and all of us can share to whatever degree we're comfortable that this is what's going on for everybody. 
Okay, it isn't, uh, we don't get to rubber stamp. Here's vulnerability over here. It's something to be despised, to be eradicated, to be fixed. This invitation to explore what it is to be human and incorporate Brown's definition says, okay, where's my vulnerability and how does it help me with compassion, with empathy, with being human? in relationship. Eric H. F. Law is an Episcopalian minister. He's written a lot of books, and he also is a co-founder of a, a, the Kaleidoscope Institute. That's a wonderful group you can look up. Kaleidoscope Institute does work on uh, diversity and inclusion and how to uh, do this wonderful thing of being in community so much better. And he, he wrote a book called uh, The Wolf Shall Dwell with the Lamb. And the law in this book explores this very thing, uh, this relationship between strength being the absence of vulnerability in a given community, a religious community, and weakness being a community that perhaps historically has been made vulnerable by society. And taking those general ways of identifying the particular group with the resurrection of Christ. So right now we are approaching in Christian theology, we're approaching uh, Easter. And so that's why I think I always think of Law's book uh, this time of year, especially, and with the topic of vulnerability, it all resonates. And so what Law proposes in this book is that people who generally identify themselves with being, uh, what would they be, affluent, basically settled, property owners, right? People who identify this way are going to spend more time with trying to understand what it is to do without, to not have. So that would be uh, the comparison to the resurrection is what is it to be on uh, before resurrection with Christ on the cross, right? And so that's the group where, okay, what are you giving up for Lent? That that kind of language. What are what are you going to sacrifice, do without, abstain from? Well, that is work that is done according to law by folks who generally don't experience being in that have not position, in that vulnerable position. They're gonna spend more time trying on those things. Whereas people who have been stamped vulnerable by um, a society that uh, permits um, poverty to go on and oppression to go on. So you end up in a church or a religious institution that is uh, coming together and also Christian uh, Christian institution that is uh, looking to explore <clears throat> this relationship with Jesus. Well, law, law notices that folks who are living they're 365, they're 24 seven, with this uh, feeling of oppression, of vulnerability, they're going to be celebrating and looking more to the resurrected Christ, the salvation piece of it, the empowerment piece of it. Where do, where do Unitarian Universalists land on that? Which side of the cross, if we were going to use that language, where would we land? And, uh, and of course, answering my own question, I feel we are landing generally, or we at least the story told about ourselves is that we are landing more on the side of having, more on the side of being in a very comfortable, not vulnerable position of being able to serve other people, to clothe the naked, feed the hungry. And we all, by not pausing to think about this, whatever side we land on, are sustaining 
this relationship, this way of being in a community that um, keeps coercion like this, keeps oppression possible. Um, everybody buys in. If we are not challenging it in a really direct way, and we're just sort of accepting this cloak of, well, this is the group that has, and this is the group that has not, we're not really experiencing or practicing what it is to be human. We're missing an opportunity to explore that in our circle of Unitarian Universalist spaces. So what would it be like to try that on? If we so if we hold so tightly to the old lessons of purpose, if we sort of lay down or reject that one that says, here's where we get to try on being human. And instead we're like, well, because we are a religious community, we're going to just do these things where we're fighting oppression and we're feeding hungry people. How are we ever going to know our own hunger in a way that it feels okay to share that truth with others? Is there a way that we can look up right now at each other and say, sometimes, sometimes I'm yearning for warmth and comfort. Can we say, can you say, sometimes I am living in fear? with doubt. Sometimes I'm worried. Am I going to get that job I so desperately want or need? Am I going to get that promotion? Am I going to be able to pay the mortgage? Am I going to be able to get a place to live? When we begin to shift as a religious community to understand that it is not only possible that we're all vulnerable to a degree at some time, it's not only possible, it's probable. It's almost 100% certain that all of us at some time, no doubt, we know fear. And if we work on creating a community, we're admitting that out loud and creating spaces to unpack it and talk about it. And, oh, who's feeling it right now? right? And to even share our insights with one another. What helps you get through those times? What helps me get through those times? Well, that will create a space where the folks among us right now, and I guarantee there are people here right now who are suffering and struggling, will know that this community is one where it's okay to say out loud, I'm not sure what tomorrow is going to bring and I'm frightened. I could use some help or I could use someone just to hear me. And isn't that what we want for our religious communities to shed the cloak, the disguise that feeds into the um, shallow, lovely, sometimes in some ways, incomplete story of what it is to be in this community? Wouldn't it be lovely to say, here I am, a whole person, and there you are, a whole person. And what can we be doing together? My reflection for you today is an invitation, really to say, how do you mess up? How are you afraid of messing up? And can you together and can we together build community where it is all right? And not only all right, it's our job almost as a religious community to explore and to share, to express what we do have to offer in the way of help, strengths, and to also say, oh, and here's what I need from my community, whatever it may be. 
let's build that. Let's level up the purpose of this religious community. And I'm not just picking on you, you uh, of Elkhart. I'm saying Unitarian Universalists. I'm charging all of us with this. And I hope you'll go there with me. May these words land gently where they may. Blessed be. We need some time to think about those words. That was a powerful message. The hymn we're doing this morning is short, but we're going to make it longer. Uh, so you can stand if you're willing and able, but Jenny's going to play it, uh, Lizzie's going to play it through once, and we're going to cut her off, and we're going to sing it through a cappella uh, as a round. Okay, we'll sing it through together as, as she has played it, and then we'll split up in this this is group one, this is group two. We'll start it uh, and I'll start each group and we'll sing it three times when we do the round. She's gonna play it through, we're gonna sing it through once together and then three times as a round, okay? Stand if you're able. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> you are such a help with that. <laughs> I'm, I'm taking a cue from Jenny, who said that the um, chalice lightings and benedictions should be from the heart. And after such a powerful message, I, I, I would have to agree, you know. So the benediction today is let's take the time to go forth in the world and be vulnerable, but let's do it with courage and honesty. So mote it be. And for the postlude, this is a little change. Um, we are gonna sing the hymn. So we'll do, uh, if Steve, uh, we'll come up and um, the hymn is number 20, Be Thou My Vision. <laughs> 